I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, Barbara Liskoff got her BA from Berkeley in mathematics and a PhD in, from Stanford. She's on the faculty of MIT, where she's the NEC professor of software science and engineering. And if I may relate a um, personal story, when I um, first moved to Palo Alto, I just left Caltech, which was a remarkable school, but really didn't have a whole lot of women there. And uh, <laughs> I um, arrived in Palo Alto, and one of the things that I desperately wanted to do was make some connections with women. And my, the first opportunity I had to do that was at a panel that was at Stanford University where I met um, several of the women that I can now consider close friends. And the woman, one of the women that was on that panel was Barbara Liskoff, and that was the first time I met her. So it is with great pleasure and an honor that I, I introduce Barbara Liskoff. Thanks very much for the introduction. I'm really pleased to be here and very excited about this conference, which I think is a wonderful idea. And I've been thinking, uh, as I listened to the talks yesterday, I've been very impressed at the quality of the speakers. Um, I go to many professional meetings, and I don't think I've ever been in a meeting where there's been uh, such a uniformly high quality of speaker. Um, okay, I'm going to talk today about uh, distributed computing, uh, which is an area that I've been working in for a long time, since about 1979. Uh, I'm not going to try and give you a uh, survey of the field, but instead I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the research that I've done and the things that I find interesting. Uh, when I started working in distributed computing, uh, at that point in time, people sort of knew how to connect computers together via networks. They had a pretty good idea about some of the protocols and uh, some of the problems that were involved in sending messages from one place to another, but they had absolutely no idea how to build software uh, to run on top of collections of machines. And uh, so I thought that was a really interesting area to get into. And uh, the first project that I did in that area was to design a programming language called Argus. Uh, and the purpose of Argus was to allow people to build distributed implementations of applications that would run on a collection of computers. Um, after I finished the work in Argus around about 1985 or 6, something like that, um, I then stayed in the area of distributed computing, and I looked at a number of other issues. I worked on uh, design of uh, replication algorithms, and uh, I got interested in the problem of sharing and heterogeneous networks. I worked on a system called uh, Mercury, which was concerned with uh, building uh, distributed systems out of components that were written in different programming languages and ran on different kinds of machines under different operating systems. And then I went on to look at the problem of sharing uh, of data in a heterogeneous network. Uh, and that's uh, led to a project called THOR, which is what I've been working on for the last uh, four or five years. And I am going to be talking about um, THOR and in, during the talk. Now, I'm, uh, THOR is still underway. In fact, we're still working on the prototype. Uh, but I've begun to think about what to do next. And what I've come back to is, in fact, the same problem I started to work on, namely, uh, what kind of support uh, ought we to provide to the application programmers who are building the distributed systems um, that we know will be coming up on the networks of the future. So in a way, um, I think that I did some of the right things in Argus, but I think that uh, more is needed. So here's the problem. Um, we know there's going to be lots of distributed applications in the future. I mean, you hear about them all the time now. And now with the uh, national, uh, you know, uh, information superhighway and uh, all the discussion about what is the national information infrastructure that will enable you to build applications, uh, it's clear that uh, distributed systems are not only here to stay, but they're going to really be predominant. Um, and we can expect many applications to come up on them, and you've heard about some of them uh, even in yesterday's talks, digital libraries, for example. Um, here are a couple of others, patient tracking health databases, where the idea is that uh, you have a national database where the uh, records for a patient uh, may be scattered across the country, but when you move from one place to another, your new uh, health personnel will be able to uh, access your old files through the system, even though they aren't uh, locally, uh, local at a system at that site. And another kind of system that actually exists today and that we can expect to see more of in the future is stock trading systems, and I could have made a much more extensive list. Now, the trouble is that, in fact, it's really difficult to build distributed applications. 
And uh, the evidence for this is that there aren't very many of them in existence, in spite of the fact that people have been working in this area for quite a long time. And I think that the uh, reason is that it's just too hard to build them. And the reason it's too hard to build them is because people who build them have to solve too many problems. And a lot of these problems are, in fact, not specific to the application that you're working on, but they're generic problems that have to be solved over and over again in each application. And so what I'm interested in is trying to define a higher level substrate that um, would allow people to um, build applications more easily because they don't have to solve all these problems that they have in common with everybody else. So in a way, this really is revisiting the work that I did in Argus. Uh, but Argus, I, in Argus, I tried to solve the problem through a programming language. Uh, in this work, I'm actually thinking more in terms of solving it through an environment. I've kind of, uh, I think the state of programming languages is deplorable uh, in the program language that we use are really much too low level, but I've kind of despaired of, uh, <laughs> of being able to do much about that situation because the reasons why the programming languages that we use are the ones that prevail have very little to do with technology and an awful lot to do with a lot of factors that are out of my control. And so I may very well end up designing a programming language as part of this project, but um, first of all, in all the work I've done in programming languages, I've always believed that the main uh, results of my research uh, have more to do with the concepts uh, that I hope will be incorporated into other people's work. For example, I can see that a lot of the stuff I worked on in Clue, which was my first project, have actually been brought into C++. Um, but anyway, the other point is that uh, uh, although I may explore those concepts, I'd like to be able to make them available to people in, in a medium that doesn't require them to use my language. Okay, so why don't you go on. All right, so what I want to do to sort of motivate what I'm talking about is to give you a simple example. And uh, I chose an electronic mail system. Uh, this is not one of the new exciting uh, distributed applications that's coming up in the future. This, in fact, is an example of an existing distributed application that people with a great deal of pain and suffering have managed to uh, make work. And uh, what I'm showing you on this slide is a fairly um, conventional organization of an electronic mail system. So uh, what I have down in the green boxes, those are the server machines, where the persistent state of the uh, electronic system is stored. So down there, I have two kinds of objects. I've got directories, which uh, store mappings from names to other kinds of information, like other directories or mailboxes, and then the mailboxes themselves, which store the mail for individual users. And, um, what I'm showing you here is that there are multiple <laughs> servers involved, so the distributed, the persistent data is distributed across the network, and it's interconnected, so directories refer to other directories and to mailboxes. What I haven't shown you on the picture, but what's absolutely true in these systems is that also the information is replicated, because you don't want the failure of a single site, for example, to mean that uh, nobody's able to read their mail because that contained the root directory, and so you can't find anything. Um, so you have to imagine that that's there under the surface, even though I didn't show it to you. And of course, some sort of replication protocol is therefore being carried out by this system, so that when a change happens to a replicated object, it's propagated in the proper way to the other replicas of that object. So for example, in Grapevine, which was the first distributed mail system uh, developed at uh, was it Xerox Park in those days? <laughs> I, yes, it was still Xerox Park. Um, anyway. Um, in Grapevine, they worried about this problem of replication, and one of the questions they had was, well, supposing that at two different sites, two different people, managers, are, in, are, are adding two different users to the system, but they both have the same user name, what should we do about this? They came up with a solution which I thought was just dreadful. They said, well, we'll just let them be added, and if there's a problem, we'll fix it up later. Well, at the, my real point is not so much that uh, they made what I thought was the wrong decision, but that they had to think about that decision. In fact, they found it very puzzling. It was hard to think about. And uh, that kind of thing comes up over and over again when you're managing replicated data. You have to keep thinking about, well, what do I really want? What kind of consistency do I want for my replicated objects? OK, now on the top of the slide, in the red boxes, I have the client machines, the workstations. These are where the users of the system are actually running. And um, so there's where your user interface is. There's some sort of screen. It's displaying your the contents of your mail, it's letting you know when new mail comes in, it's allowing you to send and receive messages. And, but also at the machine is part of the mail system itself, because uh, 
the mail system is responsible not only for allowing you to send and receive mail and providing you with the user interface, but it also has to find things. So if you say send a mail to X, it has to find out where X's mailbox is. Uh, it has to have a copy of your mailbox. And so in fact what's going on there is that there's caching of information that's of interest to this particular user, like the mailboxes that uh, are of interest to them or the directories that are being used in carrying out their commands. And another thing the system has to worry about is what to put in the cache and what to do if somewhere else in the system the thing that the cache copy is a copy of has changed and what to do if there's some sort of failure and you can no longer communicate with the servers you used to talk to and so now you have to switch your attention to something else. Okay, now the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, in this application are actually two different kinds of things going on. Some of them are application specific. So what's application specific is you have certain kinds of directories. I mean, it, it's the objects, the kinds of uh, persistent objects that you want to have in your system that are necessary in order to store the kind of state that the system is maintaining for you. And in addition, the whole user interface is specific. You know, what kinds of commands do we provide for users? How is this carried out? What's not specific to the application is a lot of the other stuff I told you about. The replication strategy, the fault tolerance primitives, the caching, the cache invalidation, the way that uh, notifications flow around so that you actually become aware that something has changed. All of that, in fact, is not specific to this system. Every distributed system has to worry about this kind of stuff. And yet, if you look at the kind of thinking that had to go on in the system, the amount of work that was required, that's probably where 90% you know, of the effort actually went, was in figuring out how to do all that stuff. So what I'm looking for is a way of picking up all this generic stuff and making it available on a substrate so that the application programmer doesn't have to worry about the generic stuff but can just uh, work on the application specific stuff. Next slide. Now there are many applications that have the same set of requirements, that have the same sort of genericity that I'm interested in. All these applications, what they have in common is that they're interested in providing online or access to online persistent information. So here's a subset of the requirements that these applications have. So if I'm going to think about a substrate, I have to think about, you know, what does that substrate have to provide in order for uh, it to provide the kind of support these applications require. So first of all, the applications require persistent information. And usually they provide, require, in fact, highly available information so that with very high probability, uh, when you want to access a piece of persistent information, you can actually do it at that moment. Persistent just means that it'll survive even in spite of failures. Highly available is, is a more stringent requirement because it means not only does it survive, but it's available just when you want it. And then I think also we'd like to have some high level storage there. So it's nice not to have to think about how you lay out your objects in flat file systems and then interpret the structures in those file systems so that you can then understand what those objects are later. So you'd like to be able to really store directories and mailboxes in the system. Okay, another requirement that applications have is for scalability. Um, first of all, you'd imagine the substrate might like to be good for supporting applications of many different sorts. Some of them will be small, but some of them will be huge with many, say, millions of users, hundreds of thousands of concurrent users. Okay, many thousands, tens of thousands of server machines storing the persistent information. Um, if you don't think about scalability um, to very large size, when you design something, it usually isn't going to be scalable. So scalability has to be taken as a requirement from day one to uh, try and avoid the introduction of mechanisms that won't scale. Um, another requirement, I believe, is a need for multilingual sharing. What I mean by this is that sometimes it's convenient to write an application using a combination of programming languages, but all of these pieces of the application will be sharing the same persistent state. I've been collaborating with some people working in the, uh, in the Genome Project at the Whitehead Institute at MIT, and they have a little system called LabBase in which they're interested in keeping track of their experiments. And they actually like to manipulate the data in LabBase in several different languages. They like to use Perl, uh, a language that many of you may not <laughs> have heard of. I certainly hadn't heard of it before because they do a lot of string manipulation. But they also use Lisp, they use C++. I think they even use Tickle. 
and um, and they have legitimate reasons. Some of these re some reasons are just that the programmers who are writing these pieces of the applications are familiar with a particular language, but often the reasons are more profound than that. They really have to do with what that piece of the application is doing, and a particular language is better for that than some other language. So it's nice if, in fact, you aren't restricted. First of all, that you can choose the language you want to program in, and secondly, that even within a single application, you can use different languages to do different things. Okay, another requirement is security and protection, and I actually mean two different things here. One is I mean access control. If I'm talking about an online medical information system, I certainly don't want uh, anybody who walks up to a terminal to be able to access my patient records. Okay, but I also mean uh, data security. So I'm talking about a big shared uh, sort of repository of information, and uh, not only that, but I allowed arbitrary programming languages to be interacting with this, and many of these programming languages, you know, are dreadfully unsafe just to mention C and C++, to take a, an example. And you'd like to feel that uh, the data that you're sharing with these other users is uh, not going to sort of be destroyed because of errors in the user code. Okay. Um, another thing the applications require is communication. I mean, they're going to be built of pieces, and these pieces are going to need to uh, either cause one another to do things or at least notify one another of things that have happened. And then uh, they're always going to be perform good, concerned with good performance. Okay, now my claim, what I've come to believe, is that the right object-oriented databases, um, extended in the right way, will provide the right support. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on and tell you about the right database, <laughs> namely my own. Uh, <laughs> uh, but more as an example of sort of what's required in this substrate. And then I'll, at the end I'll come back and I'll show you how it sort of fits this problem. Okay. So as I mentioned before, I've been working for the last few years on a THOR, an object-oriented database system. And uh, the goal of THOR is to provide heterogeneous access uh, in a distributed environment to a universe of objects. And by heterogeneous, I mean sort of heterogeneity at all levels. So I mean uh, the machines are different, the operating systems are different, but most importantly, the part that's really the most difficult to cope with is the programming languages are different, okay? And the universe of objects that I have, which as you can imagine, distributed, so it's, it's spread all over uh, a set of distributed machines, and these might not be on a local area net, they might very well be geographically distributed. Uh, it, think about that as containing uh, the heap of your favorite programming language that has a heap. Okay, so it's a, it's a heap that provides storage that comes into existence when you create it and whose lifetime exceeds the lifetime of the program that created it. Okay, now this heap is like that only more so because the existence of the objects in this heap is independent of the particular programs that are running. Okay, it's got a persistent root of the world and any object that's connected to that root is persistent um, and objects that become disconnected from the root are garbage collected by the system automatically. And as I'm showing you on the slide, there also are some objects in the system that aren't yet persistent. They're volatile because they haven't become rooted from the persistent root, but they are accessed from a, from a, a user session. This one is, happens to be running in C++. Okay? So I wrote down at the bottom of the slide some of the properties of this, um, of this universe. First of all, what we have there is encapsulated objects. These are real, you know, full-fledged objects. They have internal values, which can only be observed by calling their methods. It's a strongly typed universe, and an object type determines what methods it provides. So the only way you're going to be able to interact with these objects is by calling their methods. Um, and uh, this sort of very strong typing is one way that you provide security in this kind of universe because what it does is it guarantees if you can make sure that the only way that the programs can access objects is by calling their methods that at least if the object is implemented correctly errors in the program aren't going to be able to make the objects have funny inconsistencies within them. Okay, another thing about this universe is that it's extensible. Users can define new abstract types and also types can be related in, in, uh, as in a subtype hierarchy. And that's useful for two reasons. One is it provides a way of extending the system so that if later uh, you decide that the types of objects you've already defined are almost what you want, but they really need to do a little bit more, well, you can just add a subtype and the new objects will have this additional behavior, but all the programs that used to work with the old objects will continue to work with the new objects. Um, 
Then, as I mentioned, it has persistence based on reachability uh, with automatic garbage collection. And automatic garbage collection is another important uh, thing to have if you're trying to support this secure sharing goal, because you wouldn't want your universe to become sort of disconnected and weird because somebody inadvertently deleted an object while there were still pointers to it. Okay, and then finally, the persistent object storage is both reliable and also highly available. Okay. Uh, here's how uh, client programs actually use uh, the objects in the universe. Uh, basically, what they do is they call their methods. So, um, what I'm showing you here is in the context of the mail system that I talked about earlier. Uh, maybe the mailboxes have methods to tell you how many messages are in the mailbox or to tell you what the newest message is. And clients can find out this kind of thing by calling those methods. The method calls uh, return two different kinds of things. They return either handles or values. A handle is a short-lived pointer. So I'm running a program in some sort of client session. I, for example, call in the mailbox newest operation. This returns a message. And let's imagine that a message is an object that exists inside the system. Well, what I'll get back out of that call is a way of referring to that object later so that I can then call methods on it. And the reason I use a short-lived handle there rather than a direct pointer to it is because of this d desire to do automatic garbage collection. If I really let the pointers out of the system, then people might choose to store them in file systems and other kinds of persistent storage, and I'd never actually know where the roots were for garbage collection, and I wouldn't be able to guarantee that all the objects that you really needed to hold on to really existed. Okay, on the other hand, some method calls don't return handles, they actually return values. And an example of a method call like that is the one that calls the count. Now that's going to return an integer, and although in theory, uh, you can take an object-oriented language and make it very, you know, uniform. Um, it isn't sensible to do it. And I really don't want, when I call that method, to get back an object that I then have to somehow or other interact with to find out the answer is three. I'd really rather get back three. And so those kinds of method calls return values. And then finally, uh, the calls all occur within atomic transactions. So, um, and the reason for that is because by using atomic transactions, uh, you know, you get the two properties that transactions give you. First of all, you get um, synchronization, sort of automatic synchronization with whatever other concurrent activity is going on at the same time, so that two concurrent threads uh, of user threads won't be able to interfere with one another. And then in addition, uh, if you're unable to complete a transaction, then you don't end up with a sort of a partial modification of the system state. Instead, uh, it's an all or nothing behavior. Every, either everything you did gets done, in some state that makes sense with respect to all the other computations that are going on, or nothing happens. Okay. All right. Now, I mentioned that um, Thor was heterogeneous, and uh, so that raises the question of how do you actually support heterogeneity? Um, I, the idea was I have these many client programs, they're uh, actually manipulating objects in Thor, um, and how do they really do that? Well, there's something I didn't put on the slide, but I just realized I'd better tell you about that. And that is, the first question you have to decide is, what, how do you implement the objects themselves? And then the second question is, having decided that, whatever decision you make, at least certain users will be using a different programming language to access the objects than the language that was used to implement them. And so how do you solve that problem? Well, our decision about the first question, how do you actually implement the objects, was to define our own language. And, um, we did that because we weren't happy with any existing widely used programming language as a basis because of our security and safety requirements. So we wouldn't be happy with C++, for example, because of the possibility of type errors and um, uh, storage management errors, because we want to ensure that those don't happen in the system. And so we decided that if there was no language we could pick up, and use in a fairly direct fashion, then the best thing was to do was to design our own language. However, I have to say that um, I, what I want to do eventually, uh, in fact, we're starting to work on this now, is to think about safe subsets of uh, application languages so that you could, for example, implement new objects in your favorite language, and we would translate them to our language, and in that way you didn't have to learn our language in order to find new objects. So we have our own language for implementing objects right now. It's called Theta. <laughs> 
Um, okay, now let me look at the second question, which is now I'm writing some user code and I'm doing this in a language of my choice, which happens to be different from theta, but even if I had chosen C++, it might not have been C++. Okay, well, what we do for that is we actually borrow heavily from work that's already been done in distributed systems. Uh, we produce for that particular language what we call a veneer, and we chose the word veneer because that has the connotation of a very sort of thin layer that's pasted on top, and our layers are really very thin. First of all, we provide a few extra procedures that you can call that serve the purpose of commands. So you can start a transaction by calling one of these. You can end a transaction by calling one of these. You can start a session by calling one of these. Okay, then we provide for the methods uh, stub procedures. And um, so I'm, what I'm showing you here is I showed you on the previous slide that I could ask for the count of a mailbox. And I'm showing you in some imaginary language here a stub for that, the header of a stub for that. If I call this procedure, this m under bar count procedure on a particular uh, local variable that has a handle to that mailbox, then um, this will call a procedure that's actually written in my programming language that will do the right stuff to cause the call to go over to Thor and the actual call in the mailbox me method to happen. Okay? And a veneer is defined just once for a particular programming language. And the methodology that we've been using, we've built veneers now for um, C, C++, Lisp, Perl, and Tickle. Um, is that you sort of, the first one was kind of hard. You had to figure out sort of how to do everything, and after that you kind of just copy. And, um, and one of the things you do is that you define for the language a stub generator, which will read a description of one of these theta types and produce the stubs for you automatically. So that's how you solve the heterogeneity problem. Okay, so now this just sort of sums up what I've been talking about. And so what I'm showing you is I'm showing you Thor, on the right side of the slide uh, with its root of the universe and the client program running over on the left-hand side written in some programming language augmented with the veneer and what's going across over to Thor are method calls, commands like start and end transaction and also something I didn't tell you about before is if you can't take any pointers away from you when you close a session you have to have some way when you start up the next day to find the objects that are interesting to you and the way you do that is being able to find a handle to the root and then from there on, you can just make method calls to find out whatever you want. This is what's called navigation in these systems. And then what's coming back in the other direction are handles and values. And the main thing that's interesting about this compared to other object-oriented databases is the objects all live over there in Thor, and every time you make a method call, you have to cross that boundary, and the call really runs inside Thor. So if you start to think about this from an app from an implementation problem, point of view, you can see some problems coming up. Uh, and my next slide uh, talks a little bit about the implementation of Thor. Okay, so I've now switched from the interface to the implementation. And um, it's a system that's built up um, out of clients and servers. And the clients you imagine are the workstations sitting on people's desks. And the servers are independent machines. Of course, these things could be co-located, but in general, when you're talking about persistent storage, you really don't want to put important parts of your databases on individuals' workstations because individuals do peculiar things to their workstations, like they turn them off. And <laughs> you don't want an important part of your persistent database to be uh, subject to loss because of that kind of thing. So I have my persistent storage down in the servers, which I call ORs, object repositories. And each object in the universe belongs to a particular object repository at a particular moment in time, although objects can migrate from one repository to another. And the repositories are, in fact, not individual machines, but they're replicated. And so each object is, in fact, replicated. That's what you need to do in order to provide high availability. And all its replicas belong at the servers that make up its particular OR. And these servers are carrying out a replication protocol so that if one of them fails, they can recover from that failure and still continue to provide service. And then the client programs run at the client workstations, and there I'm showing you I've got my client code, it's running in some programming language on top of a veneer, but also there's a piece of Thor running at that machine, what we call the front end. And so when the client code makes, does a command or makes a method call, that's actually a local communication to the piece of Thor that's running at that machine, and then it's the job of that piece of code to do the right thing. And, and one of the things you can see will happen here is that we can hide all issues about distribution because 
uh, you just send over a handle and the front end has to figure out what's actually going on. Okay, would you go on to the next slide? Now, um, there are lots of implementation issues associated with making a system like this run well, and I'm not going to talk about all of them today. I only want to talk about one of them. Um, the, the, the key implementation issue is how do you reduce response time for users? How do you make their um, method calls and commands run as fast as possible? And actually, to make this run well, you have to do a lot of stuff. But one of the important things you want to do is you want to cache objects at the front end. So uh, the front end, in addition to being an interpreter of the user commands, actually stores copies of the objects that the client code is using. And in fact, it stores not only the objects that have been used recently, but we try to prefetch objects that we think will be used soon, so that with very high probability, when the client code makes a method call, it will actually hit in the front end cache and can be run there locally. Um, so the front end not only keeps caching, caches the objects, but actually runs the calls itself. And if everything's working well, the only time we really have to communicate between the client machine and the server machines is when transactions are committed. Uh, now, of course, this isn't going to be great if transactions are very short, but often in these systems, in fact, they're quite long because they involve, you make a call, you, know, you think about it a bit, you look at your user interface, there's a person sitting there. And so, uh, as somebody said yesterday, I think it might have been Sue Graham, you know, uh, there's a lot of time for the system in between the keystrokes that the person makes. So uh, a transaction takes a long time compared to the amount of time that would be required to clean things up at the end. Okay, caching objects at the server, at the front end, not only reduces the response time to clients, but has another beneficial effect on system performance. It l offloads work from the servers. And that's good because the servers are the scarce resources in a system like this. And the more you can offload work to the client machines, which mostly don't have much to do, uh, the better off the system as a whole will perform. Okay, so now what I want to do is come back to what I promised at the beginning, uh, namely, uh, what does this all have to do with building distributed applications? And what I put up on the slide here is, in fact, exactly the same picture I showed you before, except that uh, now the directory and mailbox on the client machines are actually being maintained by the front end, and the servers down below are actually ORs. And all those problems that I had to talk about the application program doing, having to do with replication of objects, replication algorithms, fault-tolerant interface between client and server, cache management and cache invalidation, all that is being taken care of for you automatically by the implementation of Thor. And that's why I think that Thor or a system that has a similar structure uh, would be a good substrate for these applications because the application programmer doesn't have to think about those things anymore, but instead only has to worry about what kinds of persistent objects have I, and then what's the service I provide to my user, what's a nice user interface. Okay, now there is a problem. There's one thing that Thor doesn't support as well as it ought to, and that's this question of notification. So if new mail arrives for me, what Thor will do is it's carrying out a cache and validation protocol, and so it will notify the front end where there's a copy of the modified object, but there's no way that this notification gets passed on to the client code unless the client code explicitly asks. So at present, given the Thor design, we have to do polling in order to find out about changes in the database. And that's not really satisfactory. It's not pleasant to write programs that way, and it's also not very efficient or it could maybe be efficient if you started to put concurrency in at the client level, but that's, then it gets more complicated at the client level. So that leads to you know, what needs to be done to really make this an adequate solution. And I believe the solution is, in fact, to use the database as a communication mechanism, to use it as a blackboard. And uh, one of the speakers yesterday talked about using a database as a blackboard. Irene Greif, I think it was. Uh, but that was an AI blackboard, and I don't mean something quite so unconstrained as that here. I mean just using the blackboard as a communication mechanism where the work is really happening at the client machines. And all we're doing is providing a way that lets one client machine notify another client machine that something has happened. So the idea is that somehow client programs can, allow, can notify the system that they're interested in objects. And then the system will notify them when those objects change. And uh, compared to the standard way of doing communication in a distributed system, which is you use the client-server model, you divide things up into explicit modules that communicate by explicit remote procedure calls, uh, using the, the database as a blackboard has some advantages. 
it first of all decouples the sender and the receiver so that you can modify an object as a way of saying that something has changed without actually knowing what other uh, processes in the system are interested in that change. And so you don't have to know, for example, how many of them there are. And so it can be either a, a single cast or a multicast communication. Also, the receivers can change without the sender having to be aware of that. So it gives you a way of sort of reconfiguring the system without causing a lot of, um, of complexity in the user code. Um, another point is that uh, processes in the system are interested in that change. And so you don't have to know, for example, how many of them there are. And so it can be either a, a single cast or a multicast communication. Also, the receivers can change without the sender having to be aware of that. So it gives you a way of sort of reconfiguring the system without causing a lot of, um, of complexity in the user code. Um, another point is that you can provide a very sophisticated communication mechanism because you don't have to just be interested in changes to an object. You can say, I'm only interested in changes to this set of objects when a particular constraint is satisfied. So I gave you a very simple example of this. I just want to know about new mail if it comes from Smith, but you can imagine much more complicated things that you could say. And then finally, you get persistence here so that even if the receiver isn't running right now, the sender can still write the information to the database and it'll be picked up later when the other part of the application uh, comes around and looks at it. Okay. So that gets me to the end. <laughs> so my conclusion is that um, Thor or a system like it is a good basis for building distributed applications. Um, the challenges here are uh, deciding what is the communication mechanism, or maybe it's mechanisms, because it's not clear. There are different ways that, that uh, clients need to communicate with one another, and it's not clear that one mechanism is, in, is the answer for every uh, need. And then, uh, once you've figured out what that is, uh, the second, probably even harder challenge is how do you make it run efficiently? Uh, you know, can you make it run as well as it would have run had you used the more conventional client-server approach uh, which requires sort of just one message round trip to get a call from one place to another? Or is it going to, in fact, always be slower than that? And I don't know the answer to that yet because what I'm telling you here is about the stuff I plan to start doing uh, pretty soon when uh, I have a stable Thor implementation to work on top of. But the advantages to using this approach as I've said sort of repeatedly in the talk, is that I allow the, the application programmer to concentrate on the application-specific stuff, and they can ignore a lot of difficult problems having to do with distribution, uh, concurrency, persistence, and fault tolerance, and cache management. And just as a final remark, um, one of the speakers yesterday talked about, um, it's Fran Allen, uh, <laughs> talked about how, how distributed programs and parallel programs are merging and that we may want to look at languages for parallel distributed systems. Well, I have to tell you, I don't entirely believe this story. I think they are merging. I mean, I do think that, um, for example, parallel programs have mostly ignored issues of fault tolerance, which have been of paramount problems in importance in distributed systems. And distributed systems um, have used a very explicit uh, computation model consisting of clients and servers, whereas what I'm talking about here, you see, is a sort of more like a shared memory model that's used in parallel systems. The reason why I don't think they're going to actually merge entirely is because, um, but I'm not sure of this, because it's, uh, and I also, by the way, don't think it's worth spending a lot of energy uh, discussing things like this, because it turns out that every time I've had an experience of, of trying to understand, you know, what is microprogramming? I remember these arguments. You probably don't even remember, <laughs> many of you, that there was such a thing as microprogramming. You know, these, a lot of these issues turn out to be academic in the long run. Nobody really cares. But, <laughs> but, but the reason why I don't think they'll entirely um, become the same is because uh, it's not because of the grain size. I mean, because you can imagine that parallel computing, you want to work at many different grain sizes. Uh, and it's, but it's because with distributed systems, there are additional reasons why you put things where they are. Um, you put data in particular places because it belongs to particular entities, because you have access control restrictions, because you have security requirements, and so forth. These are not typically a reason for doing things when you're talking about, I'm just going to run a program and I want to run it as fast as possible. Another difference is that um, with distributed programs, uh, the view that you have of the world is you're always running. And there are little computations that come up 
that run against your state. You know, and that's a very different view than saying, I've got this problem I want to solve. So I don't think they'll ever be exactly the same, but I do think, in fact, that uh, some sort of, of input coming in from both sides is going to enrich both, um, both environments. So thank you. Um, one of the problems that you've dealt with is what happens, or one of the problems, I, I know you didn't really mention it, but underneath this, in order to, you provided, by providing a lot of um, replication support, you're dealing with, for instance, network or server failures. But one of the things that we see becoming much more popular are power books and other portable machines, mobile computing and mm -hmm. lo computing where disconnection ta it happens for long periods of time, at which point I can't really depend on having all of my data stored anywhere out there. I really need parts of the database or the support structure in my local machine that I'm carrying around with me sitting in my hotel room or on an airplane or whatever. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to think about that at all? I thought about it a little bit, but I haven't. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting problem. And I think it has, has two pieces to it, uh, both of which are difficult. Um, I'm, now, I'm thinking about it in the context of Thor. But Thor is not all that different from you know, a, a file system that, where you have your shared information. The first problem is, before you disconnect, getting the right information into your client machine. And how do you express that? And I'd be much happier if it were possible to express that without saying anything. So I li li much, li like much better automatic prefetching techniques than user controlled prefetching techniques, but it's not sure that clear that will be adequate when you start to think about this kind of thing. The second problem, which I think is much more difficult, or maybe it's not more difficult, but it's semantically difficult, is uh, what do you do if things start to uh, become inconsistent? And I am. Um, a great disbeliever in allowing things to become inconsistent and then trying to patch them up after the fact. But I'm also a great believer in the power of abstract data types. So it may be possible. So here's a couple things that might work. First of all, I, I believe that a check-in, check-out model is often a reasonable way to go. So uh, you know, I really have this object checked out. You can look at old versions if you want. Uh, but you, know, you, you really aren't permitted to change it because I'm in charge of it right now. But the other thing is it may be possible to define abstract types where the type itself will put itself back together again um, when the system reconnects. And I've done work like this on concurrency control, where you can get much better, uh, higher levels of concurrency by um, having the work happen inside the encapsulated unit. And I wonder whether, I haven't tried to do this, but I wonder whether the same kind of approach might not work for the types. And one piece of evidence for this is that you know, the, the limited things that people have done really are very type specific. You know, so people sort of know how to put directories back together. Uh, and that's because it's a, specific to the directory type are some rules that make a certain amount of sense. The reason why I don't have much faith in people putting it back together is, you know, here's this poor end user all of a sudden confronted with the fact that uh, the system has become uh, inconsistent. You know, how can you really make sense out of that? So I haven't done much work on it, but I think it's a very important problem. Okay, you probably just already addressed this, but um, so you're not suggesting to enforce serializability in transactions in Thor, because it seems like some of the applications that you mentioned actually would take a performance hit if you enforce serializability, um, especially in distributed applications. And the ones that I can think of are source code control systems, probably more so than an electronic mail system. Have you thought about that at all? Or are you expecting that the application will decide what concurrency model it chooses? which I think is a really hard problem. <laughs> um, well, I've always been a strong proponent of transactions. And I think that, um, but I'm not, di I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. But, but I think that you don't know until you try it. So, and, and then I, I also think there's a bit of this uh, go-to phenomenon here. You know, people always want what they ought not to have until they finally reach the point where they realize they ought not to have it. And I think, <laughs> and you know, it, it's true. It might take a little longer to do something if you're using transactions. But if the result is that your entire system stays in better shape and you can understand it better in the future and lots of problems don't happen, it's probably worthwhile to take that performance hit. But I still don't know how big the hit is. It has to do with you know, how long was the total thing, how often do you have to do it, uh, and so on. <laughs> 
So it's another good problem to study. But I, I'm not too happy. I agree with you completely that these models that say I don't have say, serialization and then uh, you have to sort of roll your own. I mean, that's something you really want to put into the common substrate. And if it's not going to be quite serializability, it better be something that's a very uh, easy to understand alternative that doesn't get you into a great deal of trouble or you'll really be sorry. <laughs> Thank you.